I'm really happy to be here today with Ted Stiritz, whom I met at the Chino Conference on the, the quest for a spiritual home. And uh, we had so much fun talking there that we just thought it would be great to have a longer conversation here. Ted introduced me to uh, a thinker by the name of Daniel Toma. And so I've been doing look, looking into him a little bit, and I'm eager for Ted to tell me more, kind of give us an overview of Daniel Toma's book. And Ted has a background in biological science. <clears throat> so I'm going to let him tell a little bit about um, that background and what he's doing now, and then how that all ties together with Daniel Toma. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, it's... It's, it's actually cool the way it all fits together. So I, you know, I don't have the academic chops that most of your guests. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for letting someone like me come and talk. Um, I, yeah, so I got, I got a BS in biological science. So a, B, a BS in BS, which is, is just a funny acronym for, for it. And I was, what was fun was I wasn't doing pre-med. I was doing, like my interest was particularly ornithology. So, you know, the science of, of birds and at the state university that I went to, all the biology professors were thrilled when I got there because pretty much everyone's just blown through to go to med school. So they wanted me to come to all their classes. Um, you know, oh, I've got this, I've got this great, you know, population ecology class. I've got this great developmental biology class. Please come and take it. Um, so that was really fun. And I thought I'm going to go on to the, you know, I'm going to go be a professor. And I got into my master's and found out that, uh, that I just like have a really, really hard time with unstructured research. And so I have a, I have a tremendous amount of respect for people that have that kind of discipline to it, to do that. And so I ended up realizing that I would be much happier if I was doing something that's more, say, physically engaged with the world. And what I ended up, I, I wasn't done with ecology by any means. I still loved it. And there's this sort of, I had been thinking a lot about when you're in the world of ecology, there's a lot of talk about agriculture and land use. And so, you know, looking adjacent to that, I thought I'm going to go into the, go into regenerative, see if I can do something in regenerative agriculture. And that kind of worked its way into what I do now. I've been doing now, which is, which is earthworks. So uh, some of it's just paying the bills, but the best is um, doing uh, water retention landscapes for small scale farms. So that's, I'm using like an excavator or a bulldozer or a skid steer to build features in the landscape that help retain rainwater, seasonal rainwater in the winter through the summer, which is beneficial to people and to the landscape and the broader ecosystem as a whole. So the reason that this ties in with Daniel Toma really well is that the whole time I was in school and, and I, my interest in biology goes way back to before I was, I mean, I think I was like 12 years old when I started getting really interested in birds and went all the way through my last two years um, of high school were at a boarding school where that had some really good science courses. And then I went into, you know, went into university to do that. And the thing that as I was kind of, I, I, had a, I was raised as a Christian, I had something of a crisis of faith, faith sort of at the end of my high school years, the beginning of my time in college. And that I, I was seeking a re, an integration there. And, you know, the science courses that I was taking were very much in the uh, materialist frame. So, you know, to use, is, is a very flat, it's it's so great. Like one of the things about all these all these podcasts and thinkers and, and John Verveke and Jonathan Peugeot and Jordan Peterson is I have so, I have so much more better vocabulary to talk about this stuff than I did five years ago. So it's really great to be able to look back at this. But I was all all of this knowledge I had was in this really flat ontology that said materiality. If it's material and observe and empirically observable, then we're good to go. And otherwise, you have to throw everything else out and for obvious reasons that does not mesh with a Christian faith of, of pretty much any ilk. And so kind of as I was leaving school, I was working on this problem of how can I integrate the immaterial with all this, which I knew from my, from my religious beliefs, the immaterial exists and it's really important. And I could not make that connection with the biological sciences. And so there were sort of, there are two or three things that really started to come together for me this would have been about 2017, 2018. And one of them was uh, an article that I sent you, Karen, I didn't know if, how much you got to look at that by Stephen Talbot, who's, he's sort of this heterodox biologist. And I remember reading that. Okay, I've got to say, I'm so thankful that you just said that now because I, I got this material by Stephen Talbot. I started voraciously reading everything he's got on the internet. Fantastic. And I forgot who it was who sent me the material. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So that that article in um, the New Atlant is it the New Atlantis New Atlantic. Well, it also called. has a link to his website, and he's got a website that's full of chapters and chapters of, of a book he's working on. And I oh. mean, it's a, just a rich treasure trove of stuff. Fantastic. Well, that so that article on the teleological view of life was when I I remember reading that the spring of 2017, and I I felt like I had been swindled when I finished it because the clarity with which he demonstrates that biology makes no sense unless you can understand that things that live have purposes like internal internal purposes so we're not talking about um like say the aristotelian final cause like how it finds its fulfillment but rather that organisms act by having purposes that they employ means for because my entire education explicitly it was everything is more or less sort of chemical determinism and behaviorism right you've got there are, you know, in the higher organisms, yes, it's complex behavior, but they're acting out either things learned from their parents or just, and, and genetic stuff or just genetic stuff. And his, I mean, it's just, it's so basic. Like he talked, his example of a bird building a nest, right? The bird, you can have an, a, a quasi infinite number of circumstances in which say a robin will build a nest and it will be roughly the same nest even though it has to employ all sorts of variations on the means to create it. So it's clearly the robin is driven towards an end that is this nest of a particular shape in a particular location, and it'll employ all sorts of means to get there. I mean, all the way down to I, I love his discussion on, um, you know, cellu cellular machinery, quote unquote, when we talk about like DNA replication and tra translation, transcription and translation, where it's like the, even the language we use, like proofreading, error correction, Things like that all imply some purpose, which is, say, to create an informationally identical copy of your DNA, say, when a cell is undergoing um, replication or for forming gametes. And so it was that it was, that was that was one of the big breaks for me where I for the first time I saw and because purposes are immaterial, you can't locate the purpose in, oh, here are the chemicals that contain the purpose. Right. You. It's something above that. So again, you know, I, I think kind of the way the conversation has moved, that may not seem like that big of a deal, but for me at the time, it was a really, really big deal. It's like the the first, you know, here some some air and sunlight is coming in. And so um, related to that was, so I, I mentioned information, right? So DNA, um, we talk about as being an information carrier, right? And it's like, I, I, I know that people have all sorts of different definitions of information. I'm gonna use it in the sense of data. Okay, so just very basic. It's this or this. You know, it's a it's a it's a base four data system with, mm -hmm. with with DNA. But one of the interesting things about information is that it has a non degrading relationship with material reality. So, like an example that someone gave me is of a stone tablet that you engraved something in. That stone can degrade in all sorts of ways, and as long as you can read the information. It's the same information hasn't degraded. And then all of a sudden you, you can't tell what it is anymore. Say like the bottom part of that R wears off and you can't tell if it's an R or a P and all of a sudden that stuff starts to get scrambled, but you can have the material, the material aspect of it degrade a whole bunch and the information can remain the same. And so, so that was, those were the first two, the, 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 the purpose, the purposiveness of life, this, the, the fact that information is related in a non a non strictly physical relationship to the material that it's that contains it. And then the third one was, and this is how it relates to, you know, like earth work was the realization that, so I live in Arkansas and I grew up here my whole life. I'm very, very familiar with the landscape and, you know, say compared to Europe. So really it, it has not been um, influenced by people of European descent for a long time, but the landscape in that sense is not natural. So you drive down a road here and you, first of all, you're on a road. There's a lot of swampy places in Arkansas. It's Arkansas is basically either like floodplains or hills. That's, that's everything. And so you're either building the road out, out of the, out of the floodplain or you're cutting through the hill. And then there's a lot of cow pastures. And it, it finally clicked that like a cow pasture is not something that quote unquote naturally occurs. It's there because people actively maintain cow pastures spraying weeds, mowing, running cattle on it, fencing it off, all this stuff. It's something that's like imposed 
in that sense on the world, and that it's only imposed because of this whole series of ideas that people have. We should run cows, we should run cows because it makes money, because people like beef, and so on and so on. There's these aesthetic purposes. But the point is, is that there's this radical downward relationship of ideas and values that people have onto the landscape. And so even the natural, the, quote, the the things that look the most natural, like the Ozark Mountains that are all forested, they're third or fourth growth timber because the entire state was logged for the railroads. Right? You see how that's like, oh, we should settle the West. We should do it quickly. We should build railroads. The entire state of Arkansas is deforested. There's a ecologist up in New England, and I can't remember his name. He's got a series of lectures on YouTube that I just absolutely love where he it, he he walks through new, the New England forest and he says, you know, here's the stone wall, okay, in the middle of the woods. Why is there a stone wall in the middle of the woods? Dry stack stone wall. Well, because Napoleon invaded Spain. Hold on, what? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. And then he says, actually, it makes a ton of sense because merino wool was only, the, the merino wool sheep, the merino sheep were only in Spain. And it was a national secret because they could make a ton of money on him because it's way smoother than typical sheep's wool. And when Napoleon invaded Spain, the U.S. ambassador to Spain used the opportunity of political upheaval to smuggle a herd of merino wool sheep out of the country to New England. And in the decade that followed, let me see if I can get the numbers right. New England was 20 percent pasture and 80 percent forested when he arrived with the merino wool sheep. In 10 years, it was 20% forested and 80% pasture. And he estimates that in that time, New England farmers by hand moved more stone than in the pyramids of Giza because they ran out of wood to build fences and they're just, they needed to build more walls. And so they built these walls out of stone. And so it's that, you know, Napoleon's, Napoleon's actions driven by his values and ambitions are having these massive downstream ramifications in, New, in the New England ecology. So these were all the things that were sort of like getting me ready to be able to see how you can really integrate the immaterial and say the biological and physical aspects of the world. And, and, and we're getting towards the fact that you can't understand the biological without understanding the immaterial. And so that's, that's how I got to Toma. And then back in 20, so I, I came, this, this book was published in, I think 2019, is that right? I think it was published in 2019. Um, yeah, 2019. Yeah, and I got it. I got a Christmas as a present Christmas of 2019 and then going into 2020. And, and I know I said a little bit of this on Paul's channel, but it's I think it's pretty relevant. I read through it while our second child was in the, the, the NICU. And so there's a lot there's I was really primed to be ready to examine a lot of these things. Um, so that's that's when that's that's when I hit Toma. And it was the first time that I had been exposed to someone integrating the Aristotelian Thomistic framework coming out of medieval Christendom and the whole post-enlightenment um, analytical science um, and empirical scientific project. And it, it blew me away. I haven't really come across anyone that does as, say, as systematic of a job as Toma does. They may be out there, but I just, he's the guy that met me with this stuff mm -hmm. and, and I'm really grateful. So yeah, that's, that's sort of my journey to get to him. Well, while we're taking a breath here, I, I want to play a little part of a clip that I heard from him and uh, say, I think it, what he's saying in this clip is a very interesting idea, but I had just a little tweak I wanted to put on it. And, and I wanted to see what you thought of the tweak based on what you read in the rest of the book, because it, it's not really a disagreement. I I'm just adding a little piece of information, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. So let me um, let me share screen here. And uh, go here. So this notion of person or personality. So you talk about perfect and imperfect order. Can you Basically, you can look at creation in two different ways. You can look at it in terms of its final end or its organizing principle from above, but you can also look at it in its step-by-step -step development from below. So uh, what, what do we gain from looking at it from both angles? Well, so 
to explain those two first, so the idea of, of art is a good way of doing it. And I, I, I talk about, I think I use the example, of, or even somebody building a house, but I use the example of Mona Lisa. And so when, when uh, Leonardo was, was painting the Mona, so any artist, when they paint a, a painting, has an idea of the completed idea in their mind. You know, they, they have to have an idea what they want to paint. And so that's what we call the, the perfect ordering. And so from that, then they then they go down from there and they they arrange everything going down to 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 make that image on canvas that they have in their mind and that's called perfect ordering so a top down ordering and that's the way intelligence works in things you know it, it works from this top down ordering to build a house you you have to do a blueprint of the house be drawn up and the carpenter uses that to, to you know put it together but then there's a notion of imperfect ordering where you work from the bottom up so the standpoint of the materials involved you know the the first thing that comes in the materials like in a house you know you get the so again from the, in the intelligence standpoint it's the blueprint you know the, the idea and then from the imperfect ordering the first thing that comes is not the blueprint but the first thing that comes is the is the the concrete and the two by fours and the nails and the in the shingles you know you get the material and then these are organized into various pieces and various parts of the house and so the thing is assembled from bottom up and so the and so the last thing that appears is the finished product so from the the standpoint of from ordering from intelligence it's a top down thing it's called perfect ordering because the, the 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 idea in the mind comes first and then the other things get organized and then from the standpoint of matter or the way things are put together it's the parts that come first and the last thing that that appears is the finished product and so I'm going to stop right there, and uh, and I want to say a little bit about what he said there, and then I'm going to play another short clip from somebody else talking, because I'm speaking from the standpoint of an artist, not from the standpoint of a builder. I'm not talking about building houses, but, but doing a piece of art would be the same thing. I understand exactly what he's saying when he says there's a, there's a top down, because it has to start with the idea, and I think that's true of anything. <laughs> I mean, that, that's why a field ends up being a cow pasture because somebody has an idea and then the idea becomes physical when that, when that idea is transplanted into the real world. But I think it's equally true of somebody who's building stone walls as it is of somebody who's making a piece of art in that you start out with the idea and it's actually the ambiguities that occur in the construction from the bottom up that make the art more beautiful. Where if you're building a house, you have a blueprint and everything's exactly perfect and you pass out the materials to the people and they each have their task of this blueprint plan. Everything goes according to Hoyle and you end up with a proper building. But if you're building a stone wall and you're working with organic materials, the the beauty of the wall is going to be to a great extent guided by the materials that you end up working with so you might pick up this rock and that rock and they fit together in such a way that you need another rock of a particular shape or size to fit into that space and so i think it's a little bit more like that when we're talking about the way that um i say to people often i can accept either evolution or top-down creation because I can see them both in their magnificent beauty. But if I were speaking strictly evolutionarily, I think that evolution is something more like that, that there is some guiding principle that starts at the top with the picture of the whole. But then when the, when the construction is happening from the bottom up, there's more flexibility. There's more room for anomaly and context to work on what finally the, the final creation is going to represent the original idea but it may not look exactly like if that if that's a but let me just let me just show you this little clip from Barbara Tversky who I was uh, I was introduced to by uh, I was introduced to by another guy that I am talking to regularly. So she she is a scientist who's working on the idea that thought arises out of um, action in space. 
So that mind is basically constructed on action, which I think is kind of an interesting idea. <clears throat> I don't agree with everything that she says, but in this one particular clip, she's talking about how ambiguity allows for reinterpretation and she's talking about architects. So mm -hmm. I'm just gonna play this little piece here. Here are some cases for um, that are more concerned with art and design where uh, ambiguity is important. You don't want um, you don't want clear diagrams or architects don't want clear diagrams of what they're designing. They don't like CAD CAM programs because they make everything too or ordered. Instead, they make sketches. And their sketches, they look at their sketches, they make the sketches for one reason, they look at their sketches, and they get new ideas from the sketches. So beginning architects can see this pattern here and say that I can use that triangle, elongated triangle as a motif, and I can use it um, repeatedly. They didn't intend that, but they see it when they look, but it's in the diagram. And novices can see things in the diagram, whether they're musicians or chess players, they can see things that are in the diagram. Seeing things that aren't in the diagram, extrapolating from it, takes expertise in music and chess and in design. So experienced architects can see that traffic is gonna be a mess, or they can see the light is gonna fall badly in the winter but it's the ambiguity that allows the reinterpretation. Again, we've brought that into the lab. Um, so, so it promotes creativity. Yeah, it's so I'm gonna stop there, although she does say some more interesting things about artists from there. But the reason I think that's important is that you were talking about information and the, the information that's in the DNA. And one of the things Michael Levin has discovered in his work with cells and bioelectric communication is that when when a tadpole is developing into a frog the scientists always assumed that the the two little eye dots on the tadpole simply knew they had the they had the information already about how to move into place so that the the eyes on the frog face are in the right location but Michael Levin decided to test that proposition. So he de developed a designer tadpole that had the eyes in the wrong place. And he wanted to see now when this tadpole develops into a frog, are the eyes going to end up screwy because the, the tadpole eyes were screwy? No, <laughs> the eyes end up in the right place because somehow it's not in the DNA. Somehow the tadpole Somehow there's a way to find the correct location and put the eyes in the correct place. So there is a, an idea of correct, but sometimes it has to be got at from a different direction. Does that make right. sense? Yes. So that's, oh my goodness, Karen, there's, I mean, there's so much in here. Okay. Can I, can I take a, can I take a quick? Oh, I'm done. I'm done. I just okay. wanted to present that. No, to you. Those are, there's like, <laughs> there's like four or five two hour conversations just in that. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw one thing at you. Maybe we can follow this up later, but you're talking about that the building the stone wall. And I, that's, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. Like I, I do a little bit of like ink drawings and things like that. So I've been, I know that kind of process where you're like, I have an idea, but then as you're, as you're realizing it, say realizing it, you know, you're actualizing it, you're making it actual, that affects the way that you proceed. And so I think in that sense, because we're limited, we're being driven by something even higher than say a photocopy of the thing that you're trying to do. I mean, in your art yeah. too, I've looked at it, right? You're not trying to say with your dragonfly series, you don't have a dragonfly and you're like being driven by the goal of visually yeah. replicating a dragonfly. That's right. You're, right, you're, you're headed towards the beauty of a dragonfly or something like that, or the relationship between a dragonfly and beauty. And you don't know what that is fully. And so okay. as you're getting, it, does that, is this right yeah, at all? That's exactly right. That's exactly okay. right. So, so let me throw something at you then. The two things that Tomo was talking about in that clip, the top down and the bottom up, I think that, and I see this especially with a stone wall, I think there's some relationship there between creation 
and redemption. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, okay, that's great. The pic that's exactly the picture that I see in art because yes. I mean, that's the way I do my art. I start with a, with a failure or I yes. start with chaos, one or the yes. other. And then I work from there because it's a way of redeeming, redeeming that's the cool. failure. Is, isn't there a Japanese art style that's all about making broken things more beautiful when you repair Kin, them? Kintsugi, they they put gold into the cracks, yeah. And they're stunning. They're absolutely stunning. And so there's a difference between building, you cre sort of create in a very loose sense, not a strong theological sense. You create a brick wall because mm -hmm. all the bricks are the same, whereas you sort of redeem stone into a wall, right? You're, mm -hmm. It's an unfolding pattern that you know the final thing yeah. Yeah. But the pattern between the pile of rocks and the completed stone wall is not clear. And so you're, there's that, there's that cyclical nature to, or reciprocal, as I know everyone likes to say these days. Okay. So, which is interesting because one of the things that hit me was when you look at intelligence, embedded intelligence, right? We are in a sense, a redemptive form because the way that you bring about intelligence in a, in a human being, and I'm using intelligence here in the sense that Toma is, not in the sense of memory and sensation that animals mm -hmm. have, but in the sense of an intellect. From a bio, you get to that biologically by a very roundabout way. The sun hits the plants, the plants go through these processes that maybe we'll get into at some point today. And then that either, you know, goes to a person or feeds an animal and then we eat that. And then that sustains an incredibly complex series of biochemical processes in our body that let this, let there be this interaction between the immaterial intellect and our brain. Whereas something like a computer is very top down. You say, we need to store information. How can we, what's the most efficient way to do that? Electrical impulses. So you run, you know, you set up an electrical potential with a generator or a battery, and then you control that in specific ways through some semiconductor, right? That's very top down. We need to embed intelligence. What's the most efficient way to do that or information? Whereas with biological, it's this very roundabout sort of redemptive process, if you will. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got that. And then you're talking about the thing with Michael Levin. And that was, so Daniel Toma, one of the first, I mean, one of the first kind of lightning rods that he hit me with, and I don't know if I'm gonna find this, the exact page in here, but he's talking about, so his first thing is he talked about the common experience of nature, man's common experience and how that's fundamentally connected to science. And this was, this is a huge, a huge relief for me, but he talks about his interaction with, he talks a lot about his childhood in, Oh uh, goodness, is it Indiana? I think he's growing up in Indiana. Um, and he talks about how, yes, yeah, Indiana. He talks about going out into the woods and like as a, as a young man, as a child and seeing trees and raccoon and the remains of raccoons and fish in the creek and all these things. And he comes to, he, he, he says that life is, these, these organisms are causal loci. So an oak tree, what an oak tree is, is the immaterial pattern that brings forth oak tree-ness over and over and over. And so when you brought up that, that, just that experiment with the frog eyes, you can see how this ties in immediately with Stephen Talbot's argument that life is purpose-driven, right? It's not just this deterministic process. The tadpole has an idea of where its eyes need to be. Idea not in the sense of in the intellect, but in the sense of a purpose that's aligned towards some form. And so my example that I love is from my, my two developmental biology courses. And I, I mean, this, this will be burned in my brain probably for the rest of my life. It, developmental biology is fantastic. If you ever want to like be just completely shocked that any organism is like in any sense complete, take a course in developmental biology. It's like, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. It's just shocking. And so, you, you know, basically the way it's the way it was taught to me through a couple of courses is you walk through the developmental process from fertilization on of various types of organisms. And there's this phrase, phylo, um, what is it? Ontology recapitulates phylogeny. The, like we go through like a human embryo looks like a fish and then like a lizard and then like a person, you know, you move through those stages. But what you have in every case is there's the problem of orienting the organ, the, the, the fertilized gamete, right? So you've got an egg and then you get a sperm and now you've got usually a diploid organ, uh, a diploid organism. You've got the DNA, but it's undifferentiated. And so what happens is that breaks, you know, that you go through a whole bunch of divisions and you end up with what's called a morula because it looks like a blackberry. It's just like a ball of cells, pretty much undifferentiated. And you need to have 
you need to orient, you need axes. And so it, it varies across organisms, but maybe where the sperm came in, maybe which side is warmer. Some, some cue says, all right, that's up, that's down. And the up cell, the, the top cell or the bottom cell will start producing some particular uh, signaling protein. And the way proteins do, it diffuses across this developing embryo. And those levels of the protein start doing stuff in those cells at different sections. And so you can, I mean, in I've, it's been so long. I wish I could remember what it's order. It's so beautiful, isn't it? Well, okay, so but here's the thing. You said the top cell develops a, a, a signal. Is yes. That, that's what you said? Okay. Yes. So See, I, I just have to throw this in real quick. I've, I've told this story before, but I just love it. We had a tree guy come one time and, and look at a tree that had had some problems. And uh, and he says, well, you know, here, here I can prune it for you and it's going to cost $1,000 or your husband can prune it for nothing, but just be sure that he doesn't cut off the crown. Yeah. And I, I said, what's the crown? And he said, well, that's the leading shoot of the tree. And, and it has all the information in it that tells the tree how to grow. Because mm. every kind of tree has its own shape. So there's trees that have this big spreading, beautiful shape. There's trees that are conical. There's trees that come up like a, like a vase. And all the information is in that leading shoot. So if you cut off the crown, all the branches are going to go any which way. And you're going to end up with a really ugly tree. <laughs> and so, so this, is, this is so perfect, isn't it? It is. Because, and, and, and so this connects exactly with all this, these, these development of animals, because that tree is more or less genetically identical, right? All the cells in that tree have all the same genetics information mm -hmm. yep. you know, in, the, in, the, in the DNA and in the chloroplasts. I think chloroplasts have their own genetic information like mitochondria. I don't know. Don't quote me on that one. But what happens is, is right, in the organism, you've got sort of the leader, right, which is that, you know, it's, it's setting up this protein gradient and you know, say like from 100% concentration to 70, that's, you know, going to form this one body segment. And then like 70 to 30 is another body segment. And then, you know, 30 to zero, you know, that's, that's another one. And so it sounds like we're setting up this nice, simple sort of progressive thing where we're like, oh, that's going to flip on this. And then eventually get to the point where it's like pinky, you know, it's sort of this like overlaid grid of identity, which would be great, except that's not at all what happens. What happens almost immediately is those signaling proteins start getting in this, they're, they're, they're in the cell and they start doing all kinds of things, not just to gene expression, but to the epigenetic structure of those cells. So the way the DNA is packed and they upregulate and downregulate 10 different things. I mean, when we got to this point in the course, both times the, the, the teacher would say, all right. And so we've been following this one signaling protein and it gets here. And if you want to know what it does, here's a slide that shows all the things that we know of so far in terms of first and second degree effects. And it like, I mean, it's a spider web. It's an absolute spider web. There's all sorts of feedback loops, upregulating up, up things that downregulate other proteins and it's changing. And so what you immediately get to is you've lost all linearity in terms of identity formation. And what immediately takes over is context and history, right? So mm -hmm. it's where the cell is and where it's been, what it's been. And this is something that I think that we really lose. See, this it, is exactly the process of art. This yes. is why I think art ties into this whole thing is that the yes. whole world is this work of art because that's exactly the way an artist works. It's all context and history. And you the can- The next stroke depends upon the context and the history. And you can pull out a couple of cells from that, that morula in most organisms and like, it's fine. It'll compensate, right? It'll, you know, do a little bit extra. It's like, okay, well, is it in the DNA? Of course it's not. I mean, yes, it's in the DNA. The DNA is, and now we're getting to, again, the integration of this Thomistic framework, Aristotelian Thomistic framework. The DNA is part of the material cause of the organism. It's the matter by which it's made up. It's not the formal cause. The formal cause is the immaterial pattern that maintains the itness of the organism in physical reality. And that's why you have this non-linear relationship with DNA. The organism is, as it's developing and then all through its life, it's pulling from the DNA as it needs to, and it's being affected by it. But it's absolutely looking like this. It's going up and down and back and forth all the time. And that's why you can do all sorts of things and still have like moving the eyes artificially down and still have the organism end up in the same place. Even though nowhere in the DNA are you ever going to find 
some little packet of information that has an if then statement. If eyes are, you know, 30% lower than expected, adjust the movement. There's, there's a purposeness in there that makes use of the DNA to drive the instantiation of that organism over and over and over. And so that's why you can say, that's a red oak, that's a dog, that's uh -huh. a black cap chickadee, because there is, it's that same pattern over and over that's taking all kinds of random material from the world around it, maintaining itself. I mean, even, right, even the material passes through the organism, right? So much of our bodies is, is shed, the, 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 the materiality of us is in flux all the time. Well, am I, and then you get these weird things that, you know, these, there's a sort of nihilistic scientific idea. It's like, I can't, I'm not the same me. Oh my goodness, I was listening to a lecture. Oh, I think it's from a Dostoevsky novel where the guy's trying, no, 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 it's not from a Dostoevsky novel. It's from um, Ulysses. It's from Ulysses where he's trying to get out of, by James Joyce, isn't it? Where he's trying to get out of having to pay someone something. And he's like, well, the person that did that, all of the body is gone and I'm a new person. So I don't have to do that anymore. Right. You get into these sort of absurdities where we look at that. We're like, obviously it's not the case, but it's, it's only obviously not the case. If we can see an organism as a hylomorphic being, it's a formal and a material cause intrinsically united, but that formal cause is operating as much or more on the material cause as, as from the bottom up. Well, so yeah, this is all great. And and I the reason my face lit up there for a moment was I thought, oh, you're the right person to ask this question that I've had this burning question for a while. Um, but then I lost the question when you finished the sentence. Oh no. Maybe come back. <laughs> it had something to do with um with the development. Let's see, the development. Um it was right when I was oh, getting that, into species and how they're, 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 they're reproducing this pattern over and over in reality. Yes. Um, well, well, here's a question that, that relates somewhat, and maybe the other question will come to my mind. Another part of uh, Levin's research is on uh, limb regeneration. I don't know how much, if you've watched any of his material. No, I haven't. I, I keep hearing him on your channel. It is so great. But, um, and recently he's been having these cross discipline conversations with cognitive scientists and, uh, and a, a computer, uh, uh, some really technical guy. I don't know if he's in AI or something. And they're, they're struggling with this whole issue of where this information resides. But anyway, one of the things that he did in his research was he can see clearly that planaria, this little worm that he works with all the time, can regenerate because yeah. you can yeah. cut them in half. They can regenerate themselves. You can cut them into 270 pieces and all <laughs> yes. 270 pieces will regenerate. You can cut off a salamander's leg and it will regenerate. Yeah. Um, but if you cut off a frog's leg, it will not regenerate. Yeah. So he's found a way to inject um, a, a new, either a bio, bioelectric signal or a chemical signal. Maybe it's a chemical signal. He's using a chemical signal to kind of generate the electricity. He, they, um, they cut off the frog's leg and then they, they put it in a chemical bath or something for 24 hours and Within 48 days, a new leg grows. Fascinating. Yeah. So um, so somewhere inside that frog, there's a memory yeah. of what that leg is supposed to look like. And, oh, I know what it is because he often uses this weird language. He'll say, he'll say, okay, when you have all the undifferentiated cells, what did you call that thing? The rest, the blackberry? The, uh, the, the morula. Yeah. So those okay, are the morula. Those, you have the morula. All these they're stem, all stem cells. cells. Right. They're all have stem all cells. these undifferentiated cells. And then when they, when they begin to differentiate, some of them are cells that are targeted towards building an eye. And some of them are targeted toward building an arm. He says, it's not in the DNA, but but somehow they have a subroutine. They just go and execute the subroutine. He says, I, ca I can make them 
execute the subroutine, even though I don't know what's in the subroutine or how to build that subroutine, my, my electrical signal will trigger them using that subroutine. But what the heck is that subroutine? Did you learn anything about that in developmental biology? No. Like how do they know? How does no. an arm cell know what part it plays inside an arm? I mean, an arm is a lot of stuff, right? An arm is a lot of, yeah. Or an eye. How does an eye cell, how does, how do the molecules that make up any cell know what their part is supposed to play inside that very complex cell, you know? Yeah. Within the, yeah. So within that tissue. And I mean, this gets, this gets into another one of Toma's sort of central ideas that he's trying to bring forth. And I, and I want to, I want to be clear both to, you know, to defend him and also to, you know, not lift him up too high. I think he thinks he's pretty much pulling all this stuff out of really out of, out of the Aristotelian Thomistic framework. Like he's not saying I invented this stuff. He's just saying, as a scientist, I take this really seriously. And I want to see does this provide an adequate way of interpreting the data that we've generated over the course of the scientific endeavor? And he says, not only does it, it does it considerably better than the materialistic framework in its explanatory power. And so one of the, one of his main points is that nature is fundamentally hierarchical. And so when you look, you can't understand. So he says, he says to common experience in science, he says this, and I, and I wrote this list out so that I would, I would remember it. He calls this, this is the knowledge that's presupposed across all cultures, across all histories and all times in history. So these are the things that we just know. He says, these are the foundational truths we use to function in the everyday world. Cause and effect, so that there is cause and effect patterns, real existence, that things actually exist, that reality possesses intrinsic order that is a hierarchy, that nature is fundamentally hierarchical, it's intrinsically hierarchical, the principle of non-contradiction, and... Uh, that a whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And we, uh, particularly the intrinsic order and hierarchy, and that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I mean, when you say that, that immediately strikes me as, as what's going on there. We, we're, the problem is that we, we're so used to this mindset of, well, where is it in the cell that says that this is an arm? It's like, it's not in there. There are certain material things that change, but like, my arm muscle is fundamentally the same as my leg muscle. You know, in a, like it's basically the same on a material level, but it's also completely different, right? I wouldn't be a properly formed human being if I had my my thigh muscles right here. Like I would be, a, I'd be a monstrosity, and I would have a really hard time walking and picking things up. And so, and that's because fundamentally, you can't you can't add the sum of the parts up and get a whole. And so you've got two interesting things going on there with that experiment that, that strike me. And I would say on a technical level, I have absolutely no idea what's going on. I'm not going to pretend to know. What I will say is, one is that you probably won't find it in the individual cells themselves, right? Because what he's doing is he's shifting the, he's shifting the environmental context for that frog with chemical and electrical stimulation, right? He's not, he's not pushing a button on the frog. He's changing its, its context, which mm -hmm. organisms always exist in a context, you know, there's a reason that a fertilized human embryo, if you put it on a Petri dish, will just eventually die. Because humans can't develop into humans unless they're in the context of a human. Like, that's so critical. Like, we're never not in the context of a person. Even when you're developed, when a person's, when someone's developing in the womb, they're still in, their environment is another person. And so what he's doing is he's changing the environment and that's doing some sort of top down thing in the frog that says, Hey, I need to grow a new limb. I have no guesses as to what that is, mm -hmm. but that's actually usually, I mean, if you look at the way that science has progressed, there's the narrative about science that says we do this sort of systematic empirical examination of the world. And then that tells us, and then that spins out into sort of like technical manipulation of the world. And that is pretty much across the board, the exact opposite of what happens. We figure out how to do stuff and we say, that's crazy that we can make a frog leg grow by doing these things. Why? I don't know, but it does. Maybe after 30 years, we'll eventually find some sort of chemical relationship there or uh -huh. genetic relationship, but almost every single time. So I, I, I'm also really interested in, in the world of um, like aerospace engineering. And I don't know if you follow that at all. You are out in ca California, though. I don't know if you're near... Um, well Hold, can we hold that idea about aerospace engineering for yeah. just a second? Because there's sure. one other thing I wanted to throw in here that you may not have heard yet. Um, and this is some new research that one of 
Dr. Levin's um, friends or colleagues, Dr. Anna Soto is doing on, on cells. And she has this wonderful presentation where she's talking about the, the environment of the cells, the context in which the cell develops is what um, influences what kind of cell develops. So the same cell that could become a neuron in a particular medium mm -hmm. in the body becomes a muscle cell in another medium in the body. Mm -hmm. And um, if you if you remove uh, a, a type of differentiated body part from one kind of medium, and you have you have two you have two things like this growing into a medium and they're different, and you switch them so they're in the opposite medium, they will grow into the other thing that was over there. Mm. So it's yeah. the it's it's the environment acting back on the yes. cell that has just as much power yes. as the cell itself. So yes. the implication of that to me is pretty vast because that would imply <laughs> that yes. if evolutionarily speaking, everything has to be evolving at exactly the same scale and time. <laughs> mm. Um in order for these things to happen the way that they are supposed to have happened. Mm. along with all this signaling stuff going on yeah that 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 signaling stuff that you're talking about had to be developed at the very beginning of any life process before yes. a life process could begin yes. so that whole signaling thing with all you said the looping back and forth and everything that precedes even the the material structure of the thing it seems like it would have to yeah yeah that 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 does work all the way up the scale that you can look at. And, and that, I mean, that reminds me of some of the stuff John Verbeke, Dr. Verbeke was talking about at the Chino conference where he's talking about the like niche creation, right? So there's this idea that like organisms are living and evolving to a static environment. And that's obviously not the case because they're part of their, all the other organisms around them, which are changing to some degree and themselves are all creating that environment in addition to the non-biological aspects of it. Mm -hmm. and so this this relates really well with some of the stuff Daniel Toma gets into about the hierarchy of being. And so it, it, it'd be fun to touch on that because that's a that's a term that gets thrown around. And his I really love his definition of of the hierarchy of being it's so he defines life as that which that which moves and he's using move in the broadest sense possible. So like internal change would be a form of movement um, homeostasis. That's internal movement. And he says that the, the hierarchy of being is not about complexity of organisms or of existence. It is about the interiority of movement. How self-directed is that movement? So very basically you have non-living things which are all interacting with each other due to the laws of physics. And there's you have external action, reaction, right? Billiard balls hitting together, chemicals, reacting or interacting with a catalyst and, and planets smashing into each other, orbits around stars, all of that. But none, a planet never changes its orbit. Something hits the planet that causes it to change, to change orbit. The billiard ball sits there until it's perturbed, right? These are, it's Newtonian physics. And the specificity that you get with Einstein's like relativity and special relativity doesn't change that. It just changes the reference frame that we're looking at things in. When you get to plants, Right. So the, in, 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 when he uses plants, he's updating sort of the medieval notion of plants as things in that particular domain of life and like includes protists and bacteria and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. All the things that are um, what we'd call autotrophic, basically what their their life process is, they are they're taking immaterial reality or sorry, non-living material and they're turning it into things that can be part of life on a material level. And now I'm not, I don't want to get too much into this. Daniel Toma eventually ties the entire cosmic structure to the, to the, to the, to the liturgy of the church. And this is the part where I like really got blown away by what he was saying. And it took me about three years to start to even get a picture of what he was saying, but plants are purging non-living matter of their total inactivity which means that they can't give themselves to another. So he sees the entire pro the entire hierarchy of being moving towards free self-giving. He says that life is fundamentally a gift. 
Mm -hmm. It's about giving. So yeah. the first time you see that is in plants giving out offspring into the world. That's the first movement. They give part of their body up to other things like themselves. Mm -hmm. And that scales all the way up. But when you see, the reason this ties into niche creation and evolution and developmental biology and all of this is that that whole process of self-giving from the plants all the way up to the angels is constantly affecting the environment, the context in which every other organism is living. And so you actually can't, I don't think you can understand things on any level. And this is really the, I think this is the, I mean, why else would you have say cognitive scientists coming in and talking about bio, you know, tissue regeneration and things like that. We're realizing that the whole thing hangs together. And mm -hmm. so, and, and this goes back to the cow pasture, right? We're affecting the way that plants go through that process of taking non-living things and turning it into living things. And that's top down, but that's like our minds are involved in that. They're affecting the way that all that happens. And so you have this movement all the way up and down. Um, any rate, I, there's... Well, so the reason I think it's so important to look at this cell level is because I think the whole thing scales together, like you said, yes. okay, from the bottom all the way to the top. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things about the cells is um, this giving, this self-giving, the sacrifice that goes through the whole story mm -hmm. is also working on the cell level because in your body, there are always cells that are dying in order for you to continue living. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. And and one of the experiments that he does again with the frogs is he takes a frog, he scrapes off some of their skin cells, and he puts those skin cells in a medium. Now, they could just float around and eventually dry up and die, but they don't. They gather up together and they form another creature that has the exact same DNA as a frog, but now it's a little ball. And it oh. takes the cilia from the from the inside of the skin cell and puts it on the outside of the little ball. So it's got motility with these cilia. Yeah, yeah. And then all the, the random skin cells that are still in the medium, these little things will go around and gather up those little skin cells and pack them together to make another of itself, like self um, reproduction. Yes. Wow. And so when, when, hold on, when Levin is talking about this story, he says, you know, it's like they finally got, they got out of jail. They're no longer stuck being skin cells and they're now they're free. They can go do what they want to do. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I haven't had a chance to talk with him about it, but I'd like to say, why do you call that freedom? Yeah. Because maybe yeah. the true freedom is in the, the skin cell doing its task for the frog to maintain the the boundary for the frog so that all of this community working together has a frog life yeah. right now this thing has a very short-term freedom to flop around in this medium but eventually it's going to die and it can't reproduce like a real it okay. can't actually it doesn't have any reproductive capacity in actuality so that's not really freedom right yeah but well i i even see that not in the sense of it i mean i see that as as that the movement of those individual cells to cohere in something larger than themselves is so fundamental that when they're deprived of that the common life of the frog yes, yes the exactly in pajot's yeah. language to give themselves up to being a frog yes they're going to do the closest thing they can and this is this is where you realize that it's, it's not all top down, obviously. Like if you have sickle cell anemia, you can't make appropriately formed uh, hemoglobin. Like it just doesn't like you don't if you don't have it in your genetics, you can't do that. But and so there is a, a materially limiting a, a way in which you're limited mat materially like those like those skin, those skin cells of the frog. They can't make themselves into another frog, but they're going to get as darn close as they can. Mm hmm. And I mean, that that's fascinating. Again, to go back to Talbot's, you know, Talbot's point and that earlier discussion of the experiment about the, the eyes on the tadpole, it's like that movement, that drive towards co finding complete of the, the lower orders of the organism, finding their completion in the in the whole organism is so strong that, that you see that, that you see this attempt to form an organism out of just skin cells. That, mm -hmm. that's beautiful. That's That's really interesting. 
Yeah. And I mean, he, what he, the, the comment he made about it was um, if some botanist or anthropologist or something comes along in 500 years and finds bits of these creatures either still alive or floating around in the water or dead floating around in the water, it has all the same DNA as a frog, yes. but it's actually a new creature. And, yeah. and the, the point he's making there is that um, there's no evolutionary history behind this creature. Mm -hmm. It happened within 48 hours. Mm. So there's a whole lot of implications under that too, right? Right. There's yeah. not millions of years to go from frog cell to this thing. It just happened and, immediately. And, and so, yeah, it, it's it the degree to which it has an ontology is extremely reduced, right? You can't, again, this is the whole point. I mean, I think one of the fundamental points of Toma, or at least in terms of what I connect with, is it's not only can you not metaphysically reduce everything to the material cause you can't you do bad terrible science when you do that like it's it's it there's a terrible you, you can't understand what the skin cells are doing unless you understand the formal cause and even the final cause of those skin cells right because the final cause of those skin cells is to be part of a frog and you're like this doesn't make any sense that they're doing this like yeah unless you understand that they're trying to form a frog they're trying to be part of a frog and then it starts to make sense um that do you remember back maybe a decade ago when there was a big flurry of stuff about people trying to resurrect extinct species with genetic technology? Did you, oh, did you mean you, like Jurassic Park? <laughs> well, you know, we can, so you can't, yeah, you can't pull the DNA from dinosaurs, but like, um, like woolly mammoths and some extinct, extinct oxen and like the passenger pigeon. Mm-hmm. So the passenger pigeon one was great. I mean, this is the same question that was raised. And, and I again, it's funny to think back and realize, oh, that's what was going on. Okay, so you, you take the idea is you take like a, a fairly um, closely related species of pigeon and you, you, you over the course of a couple of generations, you splice in. Either you, you just replace the genetics in an egg, just straight out, you just do a nuclear transfer and then have it raise it. So it's now it's a genetic, genetically a passenger pigeon or you do it over the course of a couple of generations. But passenger pigeons had a, that flocking behavior that no other pigeon has, right? They form these insane, these clouds of birds that just, you know, miles and miles and miles of birds. And like, they'd like sit in forests and the, the oak trees would just break under the weight of them. And the, the, point, the, the point that people started raising is, okay, fine, you've got a genetic, you've got something that's genetically a passenger pigeon. But if it doesn't act like a passenger pigeon, because it was raised by, say, like, band-tailed pigeons or whatever it is that they're going to use... Is it a passenger pigeon? Like, can it even, can it act like a passenger pigeon without having that process? And I think the answer, like, clearly it was really hard to do because no one's done it. Um, but the point is like, no, it's not a passenger pigeon in, in any in any meaningful sense because, because it doesn't have that context, right? Just like the way that humans are never outside of the context. A human cell is never outside of the, con the you know, in a living being, never outside of the context of more human cells, whether it's in the womb, or, you know, it's walk, walking around like me and you. So there's that because, and that's because we're not just our material cause again and again and again. And it's like, we look at DNA has sort of become this thing where it's complex enough that we feel like, oh, hey, maybe we can shuffle everything into that and finally get everything down there in materiality in the DNA. It's all there. And then it just like, I mean, it doesn't, it just doesn't work. Uh, so... I, there, there's at least one more thing that I think you would, I mean, I think there's a ton of stuff in, in Toma that you're yeah, doing. I, I can tell we have many conversations to come in the future. <laughs> Excellent. One that I would love to get started on, I think you would really enjoy, is a little bit more discussion on his idea of the relationship between common human experience and the scientific endeavor. So, so I so talked What does about, he mean by common human experience? Right. So I'll, I'll go back. I'll go back. Oh, to that was the list of five things that you said: cause and effect, things really exist. That list: hierarchy, principle of non-contradiction, and the whole is greater than some of the parts. So, I'm going to read this little quote that he's got. This is from page 38 in the book. He said, "These are the foundational truths we use to function in the everyday world. If these were just conveniences of the human mind, why do they allow us to function so well? 
If they did not truly inform us of the world, we would fail just as much as we succeed in using them. It's a very Petersonian twist right there. I love that. It's like very much the kind of thing that Dr. Peterson would say. So there must be a real connection with these ideas and reality simply because we use them successfully in all facets of life, in practical daily use, in our thoughts, our morality, and our investigations of the world around, them, around us. We do not assume them, rather our minds simply know them immediately upon a correct experience of reality. This is what it means for human to be a knowing being. Our minds do not labor to learn them. Likewise, science does not prove them or discover them. So that's what he has to say about those, and he, he limits it to you know very, very basic things. But the argument that he then makes is, is that is in brief, because science is based on them, anything that science does to quote unquote disprove them can't, it must be a misinterpretation because that's the foundation on which science rests. But so, that, those are exactly the things they're trying to disprove now. Yes. And so one of the ways that he makes that argument, and I, and I absolutely love this, is he says that the whole project of science is to take the things that we cannot see because they're too complex, too small, too big, too slow, too fast, and render them in such a way that we can then make common judgments on them out of our experience of reality. So he's got a couple of... It, of uh, examples that I think are fantastic. The first one is he talks about red light. And so say a physicist can go and they can examine the spectrum of light that produces red light. And they can say it's what, 570 nanometers of wavelength, something like that. That's that's what red light is. We've, we've, we've figured it out scientifically. It's a photon traveling at this wavelength. And Thomas' point is, and I love this, he says, actually, we already knew what red light was. Because if you didn't already know what red light was, you would never be able to say, this is in fact red light that we're examining and discovering the wavelength of. So the knowledge of red light precedes our knowledge of the wavelength of red light. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So he he then goes on to, to bring up another example. And it's, it, I mean, it's fascinating. He's, it's, it's, it'd be fun to just read the whole thing, but he talks well, about- And the, I mean, the other thing is you have to think about the cause and effect of these things, whether yeah. they exist or not. So if, if if they say red light is simply, it's just yeah. this uh, this wavelength. Yes. Is, that, is that the reason why um, if you're raising baby chicks and- one of them happens to get a little blood on it. All the other baby chicks will just attack that chick and destroy it. But if you raise them in red light, they don't do that because in the red light, they don't see the blood. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so obviously the chicks are seeing red light. Yes. They're not reacting to a, a wavelength because yes. the reason that the red light is powerful for them is that they can yes. no longer see the blood. That's a fantastic example, right? Because it's, again, it's not about that specific wavelength uh, stimulating certain retinal cells that then trigger yeah. some sort of response. That's perfect. I, yeah. I love that. So then so then he's got this other fantastic example, and I, I think you just get a kick out of this. There's a, a name by uh, a doctor named William Beaumont. He says, Beaumont was born in, some, in Connecticut in 1785. He left home in 1806. He goes on to become a doctor. He's in the army. He says it's in the army that he met Alexander St. St. Martin, a French Canadian who was accidentally wounded in the abdomen by discharging a musket. The musket ball pierced the abdominal wall and passed into the stomach, leaving a gaping hole. St. Martin recovered because, as Beaumont noted, he was a remarkably fit individual of outstanding physique. But while St. Martin was convalescing, the food he ate would pour out of the hole in his stomach. Oh. When, when, quote, fully healed, a movable flap of skin had grown over the hole, allowing Dr. Beaumont direct access to the stomach. He took the opportunity to acquire into the nature of digestion, which was a little understood at the time. So he goes on to describe these experiments where he would take pieces of uh, more or less identical pieces of food and put strings on them. Then he would take a syringe and pull gastric juices out of St. Martin's stomach and put them in vials that he would keep warmed up to body temperature. And then he would take his little string food and stick one in the flap in St. Martin's stomach and another one in the vial. And then he'd let them sit for, you know, six out at various hours and he would pull them out, pull it out of the stomach and pull it out of the vial and look at them and see, because the big question was, can you, can we understand digestion as a fundamentally physical process? Or is there some aspect of being in the context of a living being that causes digestion? 
And what he found is, is that the food in both places broke down in, at exactly the same rate. Great empirical science. This is wonderful. We're doing it. We're getting away from common human experience. But Tomori immediately raises several points. First of all, he's making a judgment of like a non a, a judgment of comparing. Is this food similar enough when I put them in the two places? Right? Because he's well, it's like it's a, a like enough piece of meat because obviously there's no two pieces of meat that are exactly identical. There's this process of abstraction that's that's part of common human experience. Then he's making a comparison of the two of them. He's he's bringing digestion out where he can see it. it. Used to be hidden in the stomach. He pulls it out and he looks at it. But even that is preceded by his knowledge that food breaks down in the stomach. So he already he had to already know that digestion was a phenomenon before he could examine it with scientific means. And so he's he's reframing science not as some sort of thing that's like apart from common human experience, but it is a a methodology that allows us to bring otherwise hidden things into a realm where we can then make judgments about them using basic human thought, basic human knowledge, the things that we know about the world. I, I don't know if that strikes you as, as revolutionary, but like, boy, that. Well, it's, it's sort of like uh, geometric axioms. And when Gödel said you can't, any system that is complete, you you how does that work with Gödel's Gödel's incompleteness theorem? If if a if if a mathematical system has everything in it, then it, it you have to go outside the system in order the 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 axioms of geometry cannot be proved from inside the system. Yes, they cannot yes. be proved from outside the system. Yeah. Right, and so so what he's basically saying is that you have to step outside. We're, as scientists, they're stepping outside of any system that they're looking at in order to prove the things inside the system. But they're not they're not taking note of the fact that the scientist himself is actually inside the system. He thinks he can pull himself outside the system to prove the things inside the system. But the scientist is actually part of the system, yes. which is where the bias comes in. Yes. Right? So Tom, Tom has got he's got several things that he talks about and each of these are, you know, would, would take some time to unpack. I'll just list them quickly. He, so one is he makes a distinction between um, geometric knowledge and knowledge of the world around us. So he, all scientific knowledge is reasoning from individuality and therefore there's no, there's no way to perfectly know scientific things because all we ever encounter is individuals. And that relates to the immateriality of the, immateriality of the intellect so this is a, a huge point for him and he argues that you can actually only do that that movement right that says we are we're at least enough out of the system to be able to examine it in some way he says that's because our intellect is immaterial and it has the ability to apprehend out of specific individuals all because we only ever encounter individuals something that's not found in any of them right so that we can then form a conception about it right you can see a thousand more or less triangles that people have made in the world and then but that's not what you have in your head in your head you have the idea of a perfect triangle and he says that's not your intellect must this is one of the arguments your intellect must be immaterial because it contains in itself something that is never materially instantiated that is a perfect triangle and so there is a little bit we're a little bit out we're a little we're just enough out that we can we can examine these things, right? We have a rational soul in his framework. Animals, mere animals, right? So animals that all the rest of the animals, they don't have a rational soul. They have an animal soul. So they can have things like emotion and memory and senses, right? So they can do all of that just like we can, but there's no evidence that they step back and they can figure things out again. And I, and I, and granted, there's sort of like a, there's a little bit of a consciousness firewall there, right? You can't ask a cat, do you do abstract reasoning? <laughs> so, right, like, I, I, I think that's one of the weaknesses of his argument in, in regards to that, the, 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 the distinction of, of humans from the rest of, of, of animals in terms of the, the, speci the specialness of reason as such versus the, the other things that animals are capable of. Is that well, and, and I and I sorry to interrupt your train of thought, but what popped into my head is 
what precision my dog has when I throw a piece of apple up in the air. Yeah. Inevitably, she can catch it every time. Yeah. She, she if I throw it to her right, she can leap to exactly where it's going to be at the moment that she's in the air, she's at it. If I throw it to the left, she, so her leaping is always targeted exact. She knows where that thing is going. There's yeah. some calculation that's going on in the back of her brain yes. about the trajectory of that thing and where it's going to be when she gets there. So she never misses. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's abstract reasoning. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what know that, that is, but I don't know that that one's, no, I, I would just say like, I, I, to me, that's a black box. Like I don't, you know, there's, there's enough commonality and this, this starts to get into all kinds of problems. Like, you know, the, the, the whole, I mean, it's a whole other minds problem, right? You know, I, we, we're not going to be able to pull a dog aside and say, can you do abstract reasoning? The, the thing, the thing that Toma makes, that's a great point. And I think a much stronger argument is that in every other organism that we look at, there is no, um, there's no symbolism. So you can go back to the earliest human records and you've got things like the cave paintings and we immediately recognize the symbolism in that, the symbolic quality of what's going on there. Walker Percy in Lost in the Cosmos makes a huge deal out of this and I think he should because from a flat frame, the appearance of symbolic communication is metaphysically equivalent to the beginning of the physical universe. And I, I, I think you can, you can, you can make a pretty strong argument for that. His Dan, Toma, Toma goes into the experiments with the, or the observations, because it's observational rather than experimental science of the the honeybees that do the dances that indicate that map out where things are, and he, and then he he lays out how fundamentally that's different from say communication by language because there's a one to one correspondence. So there's a there's a correspondence there, but there's no symbolism. You know, you can't the honeybee can't. As far as we've ever been able to tell, right? Honeybees can't write poems with the same language that they use to communicate where flowers are. And Owen Barfield has some interesting thoughts about animals that I I don't really understand. But you, you start you start to see how you can get into some some. There's a lot of conjecture there. What's what Thomas? Well, and one of the things that Owen Barfield says about this whole idea of symbolic meaning preceding everything is that. Yes. Um, he spends a whole four chapters in speaker's meaning to flesh out the idea that that every word before it has an actual meaning has a metaphoric meaning yes that when yeah. that language <laughs> at its genesis was metaphoric meaning rather than um actual meaning or or say con say concrete or precise meaning i you know it, well, he, use, he uses the he uses the binary of um Metaphor. accuracy and expression oh interesting yeah and i think a lot of things in the world break down into that binary actually accuracy and expression but, well there's um, you you said something early on that was making me think about about models like building models and that's that whole trade-off in the scientific world of building your models because the more accurate it is the less it expresses and the more the, the more say elegant and unifying it is the less accurate it is um and that i mean again to tam to, to toma's point there's no empirical way of deciding what the best model is you know it comes down to reasoned reasoned decision making you know the whole i, I find this fast i mean even statistics which gives us the, the appearance that we're doing some sort of objective work outside of ourselves i think the appropriate way to think about stats is to say and i realize that I've said many controversial things. This is probably going to be one of the controversial ones too. When you do something like a statistical test comparing two sets of de data um, and it gives you something like a confidence interval, at the end of the day, that confidence interval doesn't tell you whether or not you should accept or reject the idea that these are these are different or non-distinguishable. Non that is a human judgment, right? 5% confidence interval or, or five sigma, whatever it is, at whatever point we're saying that's good enough that's not contained in any in any of the data mm -hmm. in, at any point um i did want to go back to barfield because in the context of this i think you 
bring you bringing that up has provided me with some really lovely insight that I've never seen. Thomas' argument about the knowledge of red light preceding our knowledge of the wavelength of light of red light seems to, or digestion to this sort of chemical understanding of digestion seems to me in some way to match very closely Barfield's idea of that movement from the, the, uh, what, what were the two? You, you, I think you've got a better understanding than I do. Well, well, in speaker's meaning, he's talking about the, um, what you, I can't remember the phrase he uses, but what you could call, say, the dictionary meaning of a word and, and yes. the speaker's meaning. In other words, the, in, the, the way in which the speaker is using the word. So language can evolve over time because a yes. speaker chooses a different frame for a word and then uses that word in the new frame. And the, the example that he uses is when Newton chose the word gravity, Mm, yes represent this new phenomenon because yeah. gravity actually had the meaning at the time it was used to represent the hearth of the home the place that the home centers around everything in the home is drawn to the hearth mm. so that was the word that that was gravity and then he used that word to represent this idea that everything is drawn into the center of the earth oh that's great yeah, yeah, yeah. So that he he was executing a speaker's meaning, and then and then you the the tendency that Barfield was pointing out, and I completely agree with, it, is we tend to lose those earlier that earlier meaning. It mm -hmm. like, I think he says it like it ossifies, like it petrifies basically. Yeah. And I think that we have that same process with a lot of empirical science, where it's it's in that dreaded word just. Oh, it's just light at this wavelength. It's not that red light isn't that. That is a true fact about the world. It's also a true fact that things with mass are drawn towards the center of, of massive objects. It's like, mm -hmm. that is a fact about the world. We shouldn't, I mean, to your point about art, I, I think in a, to a, to a one, one of the grand projects of art is to keep us alive to that. It's to keep us alive to the speaker's meaning in some sense. It's to so that we can't forget, so that we stop being creatures of just. And for me, Daniel Toma has sort of given me like the scientific permission to do that, to say, look, the frame that lets you keep all those earlier meanings is the same frame that all of science operates in. It's it, not only is it okay, you must. And like, if we want to do science well, and, and I, you know, to go back to Michael Levin, it's like he, I've never spoken with him and I haven't listened to that much of his stuff. So I don't want to put any words in his mouth. So please forgive me. And if he listens to this, please forgive me. I think that he explicitly or implicitly acknowledges that the whole of a frog is greater than the sum of its parts because he's surprised that it can regrow a limb. You know, if you thought that the sum of the parts was the same as the whole, you could cut a frog into all, all sorts of pieces like a flatworm and then they would be the same thing, but they're off, they're quite obviously not. Mm-hmm. And so there's this, in order for him to discover that you can regenerate a frog, like you first have to believe that a frog is a thing that's not contained in, say, merely the materiality of itself. So art has to do that. I, I think that's in him somewhere fundamentally, yes. <laughs> um, he, he often finds ways around, I mean, he, he, he coined the word teleophobia, and he said in the in the sciences, there's a there's a teleophobia, and he's not at all afraid of teleology. But the way he pictures teleology is a completely different thing than what you're mm. talking about. Mm. He's picturing something more like, um, well, he uses the example of cyber cybernetics, cybernetics yes. from the from uh, you know a few decades ago. That, that there is a kind of teleology in cybernetics that he says is sort of inevitable. And therefore, there's nothing to be afraid of in the sciences to talk about teleology. But he's very loath to ever talk about teleology having anything to do with anything above yes. or any sort of supernormal or supernatural or aboveness in anything. So, um, yeah. But, but the fact that he is at least willing to see 
And I think he does see the, the whole as more than the sum of the parts means that he does science in a certain way. So he's willing to ask questions that other scientists aren't willing to ask. And the, the, yeah. the, the glory of the work is always in the questions, right? So, I mean, he is, he's learning amazing things, but, but he's also so very good at what he does that when he decides to build a chimera, he will be able to do so. And that's a little frightening. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, you're right, right because, because the holes really do have meaning. Right. That's the other that's the other sort of the side. The other side to that is the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And those holes are things they have. They have they have real meanings. And that's that's because those final causes are they're all nested. You know, Pajot is always talking about those, you know, nested values and nested purposes. And, uh, you know, I, yeah, I'd love to. I, I, I think I think if you want to have some more conversations, I, I think about this work, I think there's some his sort of splitting it into the same sections that he does, which are. We've really talked about a lot of the the sort of experience of reality, and then the second part is on the vestige of Eden, where he he spends a lot more time on on his conception of life and the hierarchy of being, and then the third part is image of eternity, where he's talking about the perfection of creation, and in the the perfection more in the sense of what he was talking about in that video, um, mm -hmm. the clip you played, the perfection of being and its relationship with. Um, the story of redemption and the liturgy of the church. And to me, I mean, to me, that is, that's, that's the best. And that's, that's the whole, well, because that's, that is the, well, that's the that, of the universe. That'll be a little teaser for our next episode then. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, yeah, thanks. because, because this has been a lot. I mean, this has been great, but I mean, we've been going full tilt here for almost an hour and a half. So <laughs> I think maybe wow. that's enough for people to absorb today. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. This is, this has been really delightful. I, you know, I get to this, all of this stuff has been really impactful in my thought and it gets to come out here and there, but it has just been an absolute delight to have someone who will patiently listen to me as I just kind of tell the whole story as I see it. And we still, it, it's have. very exciting for me because most of the people who are as knowledgeable as you are, they also are working in their own arena and they're much more cautious about how they will talk about things because of their careers or whatever, you know, or just because they're, they're very busy and they don't have the time. And so if they're going to show up, they're going to say their part yeah. and that's that. But I have a lot of questions and I need to pick somebody's brain. So you've got, you've got a big brain and I'm happy to pick it. <laughs> 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 well, wonderful, Karen. Th yeah, again, thank you so much. And um, I, yeah, I look forward to the next time we get to talk about this stuff together, because as you can tell, it lights my fire. Yeah. I really, really enjoy it. So. Yeah. And maybe if you have the time, I will pick out a few Michael Levin uh, clips to send you because Please. I think there's just a lot to think about there in conjunction with what Daniel Toma is talking about. I would, and, I would, and and also Owen Barfield. I mean, I think that we could. Um, and if you're up for it, at some point, I I have a, I have a someone who's much more knowledgeable about Owen Barfield than I am is Michael, who's been on the show a number of times talking with me about Owen Barfield, and maybe the three of us could have a conversation sometime because he's in tech, and so I think the combination of the three would be really interesting. I uh, wow, that sounds. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna say goodbye now and we will get together soon. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Karen. Bye bye.